Well, sorry about the mix up in terms of times. It's uh, my fault, but um, uh, originally it was scheduled for 9.30, and, and uh, apparently the poster was not uh, saying that. So uh, it's with uh, a great deal of pleasure and no small measure of wistfulness uh, that I introduce our speaker today, uh, Stephanie Pitt-Lyon, who's conducted research uh, over the last six years in my lab and since to defend her PhD thesis. Stephanie did her undergrad uh, studies at Carleton, and from the time she applied, it was very clear uh, that she was very bright, uh, with exceptionally deep interests in many aspects of plant ecology, evolutionary biology, and systematics. She also uh, had a, a lifelong love of skill work. And if we could have the lights off uh, in, in the corner there, please. Thanks. Um, here, for example, uh, she's suiting up for her second field trip uh, to uh, the Great Smokies. Uh, she's about uh, six months old. And um, uh, I, I'm told that she really tore the trail up that day. Um, also went back. Exactly. Uh, Stephanie had the, the, the great good fortune of accompanying uh, her parents, uh, both of whom are here today, uh, to many remote areas uh, around the globe, and frequently in the company of her father, uh, Stuart Pym, uh, who is uh, one of the world's uh, foremost ecologists and uh, conservation biologists. And here they are uh, together in the Everglades, wow. and a little bit later in China. Wow. And uh, here, um, Stephanie is uh, together with her mother, Karen, uh, in, I think, Taiwan, yes. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, and uh, after graduating uh, from Carleton, um, Stephanie conducted research on pollination biology with um, Stuart Wienius at uh, Chicago Botanic Gardens. She worked on uh, mycorrhizal fungi associated with Plantathria, one of my favorite genera, uh, at the Smithsonian, and uh, worked as a, a data manager and uh, trainer of field crews for uh, David Tillman up at Cedar Creek. Uh, by the time uh, she joined us, uh, Stephanie uh, therefore had a very wide range of uh, field and uh, research experiences. And in many ways, uh, her presence here over the last uh, six plus years has marked uh, um, sort of a golden era of natural history in uh, the Givnish lab. Uh, really, I've never had uh, a period of time when we've had uh, Three such knowledgeable people as, as Stephanie and uh, Emily Sessa and Bob Wernerell, uh, who uh, have been so knowledgeable on the floor and so interested in, in many aspects of, of natural uh, history. Um, while here in Madison, uh, Stephanie, of course, uh, developed many friends, uh, including Emily and, and uh, Rachel uh, Jabali from the Kent Seismic Lab, and uh, Maggie Koopman from uh, David's Lab, and Allison Scott, and uh, many people uh, also from. Uh, uh, Ken Cameron's uh, lab. Uh, this uh, frequent flyer quartet probably logged more than 80,000 miles uh, <laughs> all, all together the, the field work uh, that they were uh, associated with. And uh, while uh, she was here, uh, Stephanie uh, had uh, the loving support of her husband Ezra uh, and uh, child uh, son uh, Akiva, both of whom are also here uh, today. Stephanie chose to work on um, uh, the uh, remarkable orchid genus uh, Corvus, um, uh, beautiful, uh, tiny, tiny orchids with jewel-like uh, flowers often found in the understories of darkly lit temperate and uh, tropical forests. They're named after uh, uh, the Corabantes, uh, figures of classical mythology, uh, dancers in helmets uh, that uh, uh, engage in ecstatic uh, uh, dancing uh, in honor of the Phrygian goddess uh, Sybil, uh, the equivalent of the Greek goddess uh, Gaia, the earth goddess. Always in the nude? Uh, apparently, <laughs> always, always in the nude. And, uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, of course, the, these uh, Corvus orchids uh, uh, are often found in, in uh, clusters, vegetative clusters, with their little shield on, on, on top. But uh, to my knowledge, uh, no one has seen them dancing uh, as, as yet. Uh, many of them have remarkable uh, processes uh, extending uh, beyond uh, the um, uh, flowers. I'm hoping, uh, by the way, that we have um, now tuned in uh, Mark Clements. Do we have Mark Clements uh, on the line on any computer yet? Okay, well, we'll have to get that uh, cooking in just a little bit. Uh, uh, Mark uh, uh, Clements uh, at um, the... Uh, uh, 
the Center of, um, uh, for um, uh, Australian uh, Biodiversity uh, Research in Canberra, um, uh, is the grand old man of molecular systematics of Australian orchids. And Stephanie had the great fortune of, of working with him in uh, many ways. Uh, Mark uh, was uh, an advisor um, away from home. Yes. And uh, really, uh, and I wish you could hear this, I'll have to tell him afterwards. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, he was really all we could possibly hope for in, in terms of uh, the help and, and, and uh, uh, generous aid he uh, provided. Um, so, uh, Stephanie uh, spent uh, you know, close to a year in, in the field in Australia, in uh, New Guinea, in Borneo, in Java, uh, many uh, uh, places. There were many uh, Indiana Jones uh, uh, moments, uh, <laughs> sort of uh, uh, like this. Um, more than a few uh, Margaret Mead moments uh, <laughs> as well. Uh, and then, uh, although there, there were a few times when I thought she was getting entirely too wrapped up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she really has done an extraordinary job. And so today, um, Stephanie is going to be uh, talking uh, about uh, her uh, research on molecular systematics, biogeography, and microorganismal associations in the subtribe AC Anthony uh, with a focus on uh, Corvus. And with that, I will uh, let you swap in. And um, uh, hey there, Mark. Can I hang on? Uh, yeah, you can. Sorry, we, we, we started a little bit uh, uh, before you. We had a little bit of a mix up in terms of time. But welcome, uh, and I hope you're not too sleepy. Uh, we're just about to start. Uh, I've already uh, given uh, 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 Stephanie a, a, a big uh, uh, welcome, and uh, she's about to uh, give her talk. I'm going to push the, the, this c computer back a little bit, so I hope you can see a bit more of the screen. Good, thank you. All right, thank she's you. About to deliver her, her talk. <laughs> <laughs> Stand and deliver. Because <laughs> I don't know if they, uh, if anyone told you that uh, I'm seven and a half months pregnant, so. <laughs> this is an extra challenge today, so. All right, let me know if you have any problems hearing me, Mark, okay? Yep. Okay. Um, all right, so we'll get started here. So for people who are interested in diversity, in, in studying diversity, in cataloging diversity, in uh, just figuring out how diversity has come about, Orchids are a really interesting group to work on. Um, they are probably the world's largest plant family with an estimated 30,000 species. Um, not all of these have been described yet, but there are certain areas in the world in particular where people are discovering you know, hundreds of new species every couple of years, so we will get there, I'm pretty sure. Um, they have a pretty remarkable diversity in their floral form and um, corresponding <coughs> with their biology. Um, they also have these really interesting relationships with mycorrhizae. Both types of relationships, the pollination and the mycorrhizae, are thought to involve a good deal of deception. So orchids could be considered very, very successful cheats in a lot of ways. Um, and these types of interactions plus epiphytism, so growing on other plants, um, are thought to drive a lot of the diversification in the group. So, Diversification via means that a lot of us find really inherently interesting interaction with different types of organisms. The group that I ended up focusing my PhD research on um, is the subtribe Acianthony or Achianthony. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of six major lineages in a primarily Australian tribe, um, the Dyeridae. There's about 170 species currently recognized. Um, and the subtribe is um, recognized primarily by vegetative features. So I have a single leaf, very thin blade, often but not always heart shaped. Um, and they have these, like other diorids, these root stem tuberoids. So these underground storage structures, which are capable of sending up both um, root and shoot material. Um, and in the case of this group, they're very, um, very much spherical. So kind of obscure characters. The floral diversity um, is, is much greater. So the leaves in this group all kind of look the same, um, but the flowers range from things like this uh, acianthus here, 
with a fairly small, hard, thick labellum, so this is the specialized petal on orchid flowers, um, to like, the stigmatodactylus here with quite a wide labellum um, with lots of ornamentation on it, to Corbis, which is um, the largest genus in the group, the group that I spent most of my time working on, where um, the flower is essentially reduced to um, a dorsal sepal, so one sepal remaining of the three, um, and a labellum, which is extremely modified, folded, um, and then the other remaining four parts, so we're dealing with the monocot flower, right, so we have three plus three, the other four parts um, are either extremely thin um, and long, or extremely thin and hardly there at all, so sort of essentially vestigial. So, um, full diversity is a little harder to characterize for the group as a whole. Um, the genus Corbus, like I said, is the largest genus in the group. There's about 135 species currently recognized. My estimate, um, if we were to um, do the, the, the sinking that needs to be done in some cases, but also describe um, the species that I suspect are out there in New Guinea, um, and the ones that I know of that need to be described, is that we're probably dealing with 170 -ish species of just Corvus. Um, they're really tiny plants, um, um, even more so than some of the rest of the subtribe. I mean, this is millimeters here. So when you see these pictures, keep in mind we're dealing with something this big. Um, <laughs> And they often grow in these clonal patches. <coughs> and you know, here's a rundown of the morphology, because I'm going to talk about it a little bit. So um, this whole structure here, from the top of this expanded blade here to these spurs here, is the labellum. It's that one petal, which has just been highly modified and folded and um, <coughs> has little pouches in various places. And then there's the dorsal sepal, which together with labellum forms a sort of tube. Um, I mentioned the spurs already, one of these little pouches formed by the labellum. Um, and then the, the lateral petals and sepals on this one are just these long thread-like structures. You can't see the column, which is the fusion of the male and female reproductive organs, because it's buried way deep down in here. Um, and the ovary is this little bit sitting right here. So the flower is basically sitting right on top of the leaf. So. Um, the pollination literature in this group, the acianthine as a whole, is, is fairly scarce. A lot of it is based on, um, on anecdotal um, papers and little observations here and there. Um, one study in New Zealand has started to dive into this in a little more depth for a particular group there. Um, this is Dr. Carlos Lindenbach. Um, and in all cases, Corbis seems to be pollinated by fungus gnats from the you know, tribe Mycetophilidae in particular. Um, these are a number of Mycetophila, um, I think primarily females, with um, the pollinia, so the, the pollen packets of orchids on their backs. Um, this is a photo of mine from a completely different lineage in Corvus. This is um, the genus Exequia, um, and you can see it has crawled down into the flower and gotten stuck on the column. Um, people find eggs and larvae and sometimes parts or whole fungus gnats that have gotten stuck in flowers. Um, and we think that this is probably brood site deception that's going on. The fungus gnats are looking for a place to lay their eggs. And by some combination of visual and olfactory cues, um, they are tricked into visiting these flowers, try to lay their eggs in them, um, and get stuck pollinating plants. And what seems to happen sometimes is once that um, pollinarium is delivered, um, the insect has a hard time actually getting back out of the flower. So we, we think that's probably what's driving a lot of the floral evolution in this group. But like I said, this is something that really needs a lot more study. Um, so one of the reasons why the, this group, the Asianthony, is, is kind of interesting to study, as I mentioned, it's, it's part of this lineage, the diurids. The diurids are primarily Australian. Australian with you know, some groups that will disperse into New Caledonia and New Zealand. Um, as you can see, the, the range of this group is substantially larger. So on the far southern end, we have two species of Corvus actually, which have dispersed to Macquarie Island. 
which is at 55 degrees south, which makes it almost the most southerly <coughs> distributed orchid genus in the world. There are some things in Tierra del Fuego that are technically farther south. Um, on the northern end, um, we have stigmatodactylus that occurs in southern Japan. Um, there's Corvus in the Himalayas here, as well as stigmatodactylus. Um, and you know, on the eastern edge, we have Corvus extending all the way out to Tahiti. So, um, for you know, a member of a group that, where the, the group tends to be fairly restricted, this, this group of orchids seems to, to get around somehow. Um, another interesting feature is that this region, which is sort of famous for having a complicated biogeographical history, um, you know, is often divided into two major regions, um, Southeast Asia and, and Australasia, which usually includes New Guinea. There are various different lines that people have drawn um, to separate these, these two um, geographical areas. The most famous was from Alfred, Alfred Russell Wallace, um, which seems to apply a little bit more to animals than it does to plants, this very particular line here. But still, there are significant differences in the flora and faunas of basically this region and that region. Um, and the fact that Corvus and Stigmatodactylus both span that is really kind of interesting. So this is just showing that line from space over here. Um, so as I mentioned, very few diarid lineages have cross walls as line. And the ones that have um, are represented usually by a single widespread kind of weedy species. Um, Microtus, um, Parviflora, I think someone that gets all the way into Asia. There's Othella mitra, um, Javanicus, and um, Caledonia um, catenata in one of its forms um, are reasonably widespread, but you know, a single lineage <coughs> has made it out. The only exception besides the A.C. Anthony is this genus Cryptostylus which is also in need of a lot of study, um, diversified majorly outside of, um, of the, the southern continents of um, Australia, New Zealand, and New Caledonia. So when I started this research in 2007, um, it was just a few years after Mark Clements and colleagues had um, published uh, a big phylogeny of the diarity based on ITS. Um, and these colors here, which unfortunately are a little faded, correspond to the, um, at the time that they published, the genera that were recognized by at least some authorities. So Corbus, Certostylus, which was often at the time grouped in with Acianthus. Um, Acianthus, which you can see um, fell into three discrete clades in their analyses. Um, Townsonia and Stigmatodactylus. So um, based on the fact that we had this polyphyletic acianthus and these very distinct, usually well-supported clades, um, Mark and colleagues went ahead and, and divided this up into 16 different genera. Saying, okay, we recognize this is a, a discrete evolutionary lineage. We're gonna call it a genus and you know, we'll, um, resolution along the backbone isn't necessarily very good, but these groups we think are distinct evolutionary lineages. Um, this got some backlash because it went from being five to being 16. Um, it was sort of a trend at the time. Um, if Mark and David hadn't done this, uh, the um, Polish botanist uh, uh, Schalchetto was, was well on his way to, to splitting this group up as well. Um, and as we'll see, a lot of these groups do hold up in later analyses. Um, but this classification was not accepted by Q. Eventually it wasn't accepted by um, the consortia of Australia and Herbaria. Um, and there were some other issues with this as well, such as this group here, right, which we see is actually a thick branch, so well supported. Um, this contains well over half the species in the genus, and they had pretty poor representation because these are the things that make it outside of those well-sampled southern continents. Um, so to show you a little bit of the diversity of these groups, so these correspond to the, the genera that, um, that Mark and um, David Jones and others um, described. So that first early diverging lineage, Nacianthus, was um, split. This, this name is actually Chiquetto's name, who had noticed it was sort of distinctive morphologically um, into the Sparacianthus. 
Townsonia had been recognized for quite a while. Um, Acianthus, the Australian and New Zealand ones, were split into Acianthus sensu stricto and Nem Acianthus, which had been recognized for this fairly distinctive floral morphology, this really long um, appendages. Stigmetodactylus, which also had been recognized for a long time. And then we had this issue of the New Caledonian Acianthus, which were split into Acianthopsis and Acianthella, um, and um, Cervostylus, which I said had been sort of moved in and out of Acianthus. Corbus, um, which you know, has this fairly distinctive morphology, but also had these distinct lineages that were well separated, was divided into eight genera, as you can see here. Um, and I'm going to go through the characteristics that were used to define these in a second. So, showing some of the floral diversity in the genus Corvus. These were various characters that were found to be important. Um, we have some lineages where there are spurs at the base of the labellum, and some where there are these open oracles. We have some lineages where those, those lateral petals and sepals, like I said, are essentially vestigial, and some where they're really quite long. Um, there are a couple of lineages that have this fairly long curved column. Most of the rest of um, the genus, in the broad sense, has a sort of short, stubby column. Um, I hope I didn't miss the next one. Um, a few um, species, especially in New Guinea, have this very inflated labellum, which, if you get it from the right angle, looks sort of like a big pregnant belly, actually. <laughs> I missed one. I missed the... Yes. So, um, I mean, one of the really obvious differences in morphology is that some of them have this dorsal sepal, which is huge, which basically <coughs> encloses the rest of the flower. Um, it, this includes the type of, of the genus. So, And then there's this one weird lineage that's a microheterotroph. There's actually two origins of microheterotrophy, but one hasn't been collected in over 100 years. So this is the only one that we know anything about, um, and it's sort of out there on its own, and so was given um, recognition at the generic level. Um, so given the controversy about what groups to recognize, given the potential interest in uh, floral morphology and biogeography of this group, um, I set out to construct a well-resolved, well-supported phylogeny of the subtribe. Um, I wanted to look at these proposed taxonomic changes um, and test to see how, um, how well they held up in an expanded um, sampling, both of genes and of taxa, um, and maybe make some recommendations for how can we split this up in a way that people are likely to accept, um, to look at major patterns of floral evolution, and to, given the wide distribution of this group, um, to look at uh, the biogeographical history. Uh, so, a sampling of this group was a, a, a very long, intensive process involving lots and lots of grant permits. Um, <laughs> I made two extended trips to Australia, um, and with the help from <coughs> Mark's network was able to get samples from a lot of the rest of the range as well. Um, so I spent time in, in Canberra, um, in South Australia, in Western Australia, um, partially funded by, by Tom as we drove around collecting both Banksia and Corvus, that's pretty awesome, <laughs> um, um, and had samples sent in from, from Tasmania and Victoria as well. Um, also through Mark's collaborators, we were able to get um, essentially all of the recognized taxa, including a bunch of tag names, so names that people thought might be, represent distinct lineages from this region as well, and New Caledonia. Um, I did three trips to, um, to Malaysia, so Peninsula Malaysia, Sabah, and Sarawak, um, which all have their own separate state governments and permitting. <laughs> um, I did a very short trip to Java, a short trip to Taiwan, and then I was in um, Papua New Guinea for close to four months um, searching for Corvus. Um, when I realized what the, the distribution of species in Corvus looked like, that there was you know, roughly half of the recognized taxa were from Papua New Guinea, and that 
or from New, the island of New Guinea, primarily Papua New Guinea, um, and that um, even even so, it looked like they were very poorly studied, they were very poorly sampled, and there's probably a lot more diversity out there. But okay, I'm going to have to eat the PNG. Um, and this is considered one of the most challenging tropical regions in the world to do field work. It's extremely expensive, it's extremely difficult logistically, parts of it are very dangerous. Um, but I went um, with a lot of help from other people. So the core business case are growing in this type of terrain. Right? So this is, uh, this is taken from some little missionary plane that we were flying in. Um, you know, flying around and you know, it feels like an aluminum bucket sometimes. <laughs> like coming out of the clouds a few hundred meters above these mountains. <laughs> um, the infrastructure in places is terrible. This is the main road up to the like primary tourist site in the mountains. And as you can see, people have just stolen the boards. <laughs> um, so you're like trying to balance your wheels and hope they don't get stuck uh, on these little tiny ridges here. Um, working with people in Papua New Guinea is really rewarding. It's also really, really frustrating sometimes. There's a lot of cultural differences. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, well, we helped you, so give us more money. <laughs> and uh, sorting through all those negotiations takes a lot of work and practice. And uh, I was really glad to have a lot more experienced people with me. Um, so I have you know, porters who carried bags for us because we're not nearly as good at walking up and down these mountains as they are, um, and lots of guides. Um, uh, kind of primitive accommodations. Actually, all of us, like all of these guys, Plus, my friend's husband and I all slept in this little tiny hut one night and got fleas as a result. <laughs> um, the other challenge with working in New Guinea taxa is, and, and Corbis in particular, is these are the, this is what I have to work with. These are the type specimens for a couple of species. Okay, like this one's missing a large chunk of the labellum. This just looks like a giant blob. <laughs> um, and the, the illustrations, while you know, I, Schlechter did what he could. They're, they're pretty coarse in a lot of cases. There's a number of species that could look like this. Um, and, you know, Van Royen, who did a lot of work on this group, often was boiling up these things and trying to draw them. And, you know, so they're still sort of drawn in the way that they were pressed in a lot of cases. It's really hard to interpret the features. Um, so I spent a lot of time you know, trying to figure things out. Like, process of elimination and comparing lots and lots of specimens um, and in some cases we were able to actually refine some of these taxa and you know I would not have predicted when I first started that you know this thing was actually this right <laughs> so definitely a challenging group to work on and a lot of people thought I was kind of nuts to make this on in the first place <laughs> okay, so let's get into like what I actually did here besides lots of field work. Um, so in reconstructing evolutionary history, um, these days we're often dealing with a lot of DNA data. Um, so a l I did a lot of this work in sort of the standard way of um, running PCR, so amplifying particular chunks of DNA, um, Sanger sequencing, um, and then dealing with alignments, both of these separate genes and then eventually with a big concatenated data set. Um, and this is my final phylogeny, which I realize is going to be a little hard for you to see, um, but I want to point out a few things here. So these are the 16 genera from, um, from Clements et al. Um, and to the extent that you can actually differentiate the colors, I realize it's kind of hard, a lot of these are held up as monophyletic groups. Um, these support values, you'll have to take my word for it, along the backbone are mostly pretty good, with a couple of exceptions here and, and here, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so mostly achieved this objective of getting this well-resolved, well-supported phylogeny um, to look at other aspects of evolution. There are a few places that were a bit more problematic, though. So um, in this group, which turns out to be, all of these have spurs. So this, this turns out to be characterized by having spurs rather than oracles. Um, the genera Corbis in the strict sense, um, Calciaria, and Gastrocyphon are all kind of intermixed, especially in, um, in the New Guinean taxa. Um, another problematic area um, is in the, the New Caledonian Achianthus. So while these three groups here, well, so stigmatodactylus turned out to be 
well supported um, as sister to these New Caledonian taxa here. Um, these had been um, described by, um, by David Jones and Mark Clements um, as distinct genera because they seem to represent these distinct lineages. But one of these has extremely poor support. And certainly support for this group as a whole is much greater than it is for you know, this grouping, which some people have tried to recognize, or you know, this genus here. So um, in my thesis, I propose um, slightly revised generic limits to account for the polyphyly of, of Acianthus, um, but to um, you know, recognize well-supported monophyletic groups that are morphologically distinct, um, while conserving historically recognized names to the extent possible. Because that was one of the really big objections. That it was just, it was really hard for people to have to go from dealing with five genera to dealing with 16. Um, and avoiding monotypic genera in particular, because it's sort of redundant information that suddenly start piling all of these um, hierarchical classifications on a single species. So based on that, um, this is what I'm proposing, and Mark and I should probably talk through some of this, but um, <laughs> 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 um, keeping Corbus as monophyletic. Um, uh, keeping Corbus as a, as a single genus. I mean, it's clearly monophyletic, it's well supported in all the analyses. There are these really distinct lineages, um, especially in Australia and New Zealand. But when we try to get into this, you know, avoiding monotypic genera, this thing here becomes problematic. Um, so this was recognized in uh, its own genus, Singularibus. Um, and its placement jumps around enough to, to make any clear division than this. Um, pretty difficult. Um, and in addition, the characters that support this um, versus this are, are sort of minimal, and they probably are plesiomorphic, if you, if you understand what that term means. Um, Certus stylus, which, like I said, it variously didn't place in Acianthus, but um, Mark and David had done a lot of good um, morphological work showing that this really is, is a distinct group. An expanded stigmatodactylus then, that encompasses most of what was originally put in Acianthus. Um, given that this is well supported, there are actually good morphological features that support this grouping as well. Um, Acianthus being restricted to um, the Australia and New Zealand taxa, including the one that's a little bit weird. Um, but again, trying to avoid monotypic genera. And then an expanded townsonia incorporating the weird um, lineage from New Caledonia. Again, it turns out that there are morphological characters to support this as well. So we're back down to five. These are the same five that Q recognizes, but the, the limits of those um, genera are different under my proposed classification. All right, so enough with nomenclature and things. Um, I want to mention those, those few points in the phylogeny where I definitely had some real conflict between my different partitions. What I showed you before was concatenated chloroplast data plus ITS plus two nuclear genes. Um, for the most part, those separate genes tell the same story. Um, but there are a few places, like I said, where they, they don't quite. Um, so this group here, or this, this single lineage here, Corbus oblongus, this is the singularibus, um, in ITS is strongly supported as sister to this group that has the spurs. Um, sorry, in chloroplast. In ITS, it's strongly supported as sister, relatively, to, um, to the rest of the genus. So if I throw out ITS, actually, um, the combined data set does support its position here with, with pretty high confidence. Um, so whether there's something weird going on with the ITS sequence or there's some sort of weird hybridization history, we don't really know. Um, the other group is um, a fairly small group on the Sunda Shelf, so in Southeast Asia, where um, based on chloroplast data, it's sister to other things from the Sunda Shelf. Based on IPS data, it's sister to um, this mainland Asia clade plus things from the um, Sunda Shelf. And this is sort of interesting because like, this is what you would expect from, uh, from geography. This is what you would actually expect from morphology. And so 
that probably is really a case of, of hybridization of chloroplast capture, some sort of um, event that um, you know this is actually reflecting. Um, so I talked about how those those genera um, in um, the spurred clade were all kind of mixed up, and this is a big reason why. So do you remember that really strongly hooded dorsal sepal? Okay, that looks like it has arisen three times at least. So here in this primarily Australian group, and then twice in New Guinea. And this is actually pretty remarkable convergence in floral form. So um, in Australia, this thing is sister to a bunch of um, species that basically look like this. This one's actually from Java, and I'll talk about that one in a second. Um, but these are closely related, and they're closely related to that. These things here really look very similar. In fact, I was really shocked and kept like sequencing to make sure I was definitely getting the right individuals to make sure that these are not at all related. In fact, they're closely related to a species that looks like this. So, interesting. Probably selection driven by pollinators, but we don't know for sure. So, um, also used um, dates from the literature, because orchids don't have a great fossil record. We now have three fossils, um, none of which are particularly close to the diarids. Um, but based on the, the, the dating analysis that I did, we're estimating um, an age for the, the crown, um, Achianthony, at around 26 million years, um, for Corbus at about 14, and then the other two dates that I put on here specifically to point out are these inferred uh, dispersals out of this area into this area here. So at 10 million years for, um, that right, yes, I did. So about 12 million years for Stigmatodactylus, and about 10 million years for, for Corvus. So um, this is based on the, the work of Robert Hall, um, who in the last 20 years in particular has really started to delve into the ge geological history um, and reconstruct where exactly land masses were, and importantly, if they were above water or not. So a lot of us have had fairly sort of simplistic ideas of, you know, these masses of land moving around and getting closer together, um, but a lot of these things were submerged until fairly recently. So at 10 million years, so the time when Corvus is thought to have dispersed across this line, um, New Guinea, which unfortunately you can't see, is primarily <coughs> underwater and doesn't really start to um, undergo substantial mountain building and uplift until about 5 million years ago. Um, a lot of the Sunda Shelf is still underwater as well. The main area of uplands was in um, northern Borneo here. Um, additional sort of landmarks, uh, I should have put up a map that had uh, New Zealand as well. So at about 30 million years ago, um, New Caledonia and New Zealand um, were submerged into water. They had separated 8 million years ago both came up in the next 10 million years. So at this point, we have a well-separated Australia, New Zealand, New Caledonia. New Caledonia and New Zealand have just recently come up out of the water, um, but a lot of this you know, supposedly connecting land was still under the water um, in this part of the world. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so this is what it looks like when I, I try to um, reconstruct the exact dispersal events. And I'm going to talk about dispersal because we really don't have any evidence for vicariance. And these land masses, like I said, were already really well separated or they were still underwater and so connection's not even an issue at this point. Um, so I'll point out a few things. The first here is yes, concerning dispersal from Australia to New Caledonia and New Zealand, which are the majority of the inferred dispersal events in this group. Um, it turns out this is a really well-known pattern. There are very strong winds, cold winds, that come sweeping across um, and connecting, in particular, Southeast Australia with, um, with New Zealand. So this is from a paper by San Martin et al, um, looking at a bunch of different groups, and by far, you know, the, the, 
the greatest likelihood of dispersal that they, they found was from Australia to New Zealand. So we definitely see that with Corbis. They have wind dispersed seeds, like that's not particularly surprising. Um, it is pretty impressive the number of times that it seems to have done this. So what about the rest of the uh, dispersal? So this is an analysis looking at these groups that have crossed Wallace's line, essentially, that have dispersed between Southeast Asia and Australasia. And this was looking at both plant and animal groups. Um, this is a group out of Leiden. And what they found is, even though we don't have um, a strong history of vicariance, the dispersal pathways tend to be fairly fixed. It tends to be sort of a fairly linear, linear um, trajectory for a lot of these things. They sort of followed the land masses in the order you would expect them geographically. So you know, we, have the, we have Pacifica out here, Australia and New Guinea, um, the Moluccas, so this area, Wallisia, sort of in the middle, um, and then you know, here's the, the Sunda Shelf, here's the adjacent um, Philippines, and then some of these things sort of came out in slightly weird places, but, but groupings within mainland Asia, for instance. So is this the case for Corvus um, and Stigmatodactylus? Sort of. Um, so one of the really surprising findings is um, my reconstruction suggests two dispersals directly from Australia to Java, bypassing New Guinea, um, and then either one or two dispersals into New Guinea with you know, some things um, dispersing out to the Pacific Islands, but most, um, you know, most of the major lineages in New Guinea having originated there. Um, so sort of massive diversification within New Guinea. Um, and, and not a lot of dispersal out except into the neighboring islands. So that was, like I said, really surprising. Um, it's surprising for a few reasons. So that dispersal event is estimated at around 10 million years. At the time, Java, so there's this area in the Sunda Shelf up here um, that is above water, um, but Java was basically just a few volcanic islands at the time. But admittedly, that's where Corvus is found now, is on these little volcanic um, islands in a sea of people and lowlands. Um, and one of these, well, one of them is sort of far back in the past. We know this has happened recently. So there's this group that's primarily Eastern Australian, and stuck in the middle of it is this thing which looks just like it, which turns out to actually be very closely related. Um, this is really kind of hard for me to reconcile because there's no Corvus here, um, even though that's, you know, that's not too far of a distance. But this is totally inhospitable to, to Corvus and to, in fact, most of the rest of the um, tribe these days. Um, as I mentioned, it looks like most of the attacks in New Guinea have originated from a single radiation um, or two. So all of this diversity here, um, and I mean, you can see some of the differences here, how long these are, how inflated the labellum is, the markings, the leaf shapes, everything. Single radiation beginning about five to six million years ago, coinciding with um, major uplift and mountain building in New Guinea. So that was a pretty interesting finding as well. Um, a lot of people who work on orchids in New Guinea really think that it needs to be considered as an analogous case to the, the Andes uplift. Um, the old world tropics don't tend to get as much respect. <laughs> the new world tropics tend to be really well studied in comparison. Um, and it's partly because New Guinea has been so difficult to do work in, um, I think, that we don't recognize this as a major um, hotspot for diversity. Um, one more. Um, this dispersal event from um, New Guinea to Taiwan directly, apparently, was a bit surprising. Definitely doesn't follow what you would expect in the normal chain of dispersal events. And I think emphasizes the importance for these of these occasional chance dispersal events. So I found this thing in New Guinea, it's a new species, and I thought, gosh, they just described this thing from Taiwan that looks just like that. And it, indeed, they're very, very close. Not the same species, they definitely have some morphological and molecular differences, but that was another interesting, surprising finding. Okay, so for 
done with sort of the big picture of the, of the genus um, and the, the subtribe. Um, the next thing that I wanted to try to address was how do we deal with these really recently evolved groups? So um, this is a problem throughout systematics that when you have a group that's very recently speciated, it's hard to set boundaries on like, what constitutes, constitutes a species, and um, it's also hard to reconstruct the evolutionary history. Um, in Australia, this is um, you know, particularly challenging sometimes because there's so many um, orchid enthusiasts who go out and, and find morphological variants, and um, it's really interesting, and they sometimes want to propose them as new species, and, um, and so you know, the number of these names sort of starts to accumulate, and we don't have the data to, to test any of these hypotheses about what's a species and what's not. Again, sorry about that. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, so one such group is this clade right here, which um, was described by um, Mark Clemens and David Jones as the genus. Corizanthes. Um, that was an, an older name that had been applied to some taxa, including Corvus fimbriatus here. Um, from the dating analysis, we estimated the, the age for this, for the crown taxa here at between one and two million years. So, so quite young. Um, this is showing you some of the diversity, which appears to have arisen within those one to two million years. We have species with these very long fringes on the labellum. We have species with very coarse teeth. Um, differences in um, whether this is notched, whether there's a big close up boss, sort of a big impressed area. Um, and then there's this group here, which is currently recognized as consisting of three species, with another couple which have been proposed as new taxa, um, which live on sand dunes, tend to be um, self pollinating. Um, sort of a, a, another distinct morphology. So the, the habitat for this group, I mean, this group is spread across Australia, um, and the habitat's pretty pretty variable. Like I mentioned there are some things that grow on these dunes. I mean, I took this probably standing on top of a corvus here. Um, <laughs> um, and then in the same group, um, very closely related, there are taxa that grow in the um, the southeastern highlands in Australia, so up on mountains above a thousand meters in some cases, which is pretty high for Australia. Um, we have, you know, this is what the coastal scrub, some of the grow in, looks like, to drier sclerophyll forest, to quite wet subtropical um, sclerophyll forest. So when I was in Australia, this was a group I particularly targeted in terms of collection. We got a lot of samples sent in from other people as well. Um, we managed to get material from um, all over Western Australia, um, throughout a lot of Southeastern Australia, really good sampling in South Australia, and even down into Tasmania. So the first thing I did was sort of try the standard approaches of I'm going to throw couple nuclear genes and some quickly evolving chloroplast spaces at this group and see, can I get some resolution? And it turns out, <laughs> you throw it all together um, and you squint really hard. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, you know, the question is how much do you want to trust something like this when the branch lengths, branch lengths are this short? So, um, I mean, yes, we do see strongly supported groups. One, two, three, four, five, and six and relatively good support among them. Um, but certainly no resolution within these groups. So for people who wanted to know, like, is this population that I found that looks really different, like, is it actually a distinct lineage? Um, we couldn't answer these questions um, with, with this type of data. So, um, I uh, took a big leap um, and used a technique called GBS, genotyping by sequencing which um, you start out with your entire genomic DNA, you digest, you ligate adapters, you amplify them. Anyone who's done AFLPs, um, to anyone who's done AFLPs, that process will sound very familiar. 
The difference is then you sequence these libraries um, and you do it in this um, highly multiplexed, um, very newfangled way involving bridge amplification. We don't need to go into that. Um, and get an enormous amount of data back. Um, and then the next challenge is dealing with all of those data. So I got my data back finally in November. I got my um, data through the analysis pipeline roughly three weeks ago. <laughs> and so there are a lot of analysis I would have liked to do on this data set, but haven't had time to do yet. Um, this is the result based on parsimony, concatenating the tens of thousands of SNPs that were informative that I got out of that analysis. And we recover one, two, three, four, five, six, those, oh, sorry, yes, five, six, those same um, six lineages that we saw with the standard Sanger sequencing data. Um, but we also recover a lot of resolution within them, some of which has some support and makes sense in terms of geography and morphology. Um, also, these two very recently diverged taxa, I was completely unable to separate with, my, with these other markers. And indeed, we have pretty good support for them as distinct um, species. So I wanted to point out a few other things here. Um, there are a couple of groups that have been recognized at the federal level as being threatened or endangered um, and are protected right now. And um, in one case, this dentatus, we now have evidence to suggest that it's probably a hybrid, um, which people sort of suspected from the morphology as well. It's variable across populations. Um, the, um, some of the data that I didn't put up actually shows that even with those nuclear genes, we can see that different regions place it either with um, incurvus or with the aminicus. Um, so it's pretty strongly suggestive that, <coughs> that that's probably just a, a hybrid. On the other hand, we have this um, lineage here, which appears to be fairly closely related to things from Tasmania, but within Victoria, a lot of these Victoria, um, this is definitely different than the other major groups that are there. And so these botanists who went out and said, you know, like, yeah, I know you think we're all splitting, but um, this thing really does look different. It's in a very distinct habitat. We're, we're completely right. It's a distinct evolutionary lineage within the context of Victoria in particular. Um, so that was really kind of kind of neat to see that people were picking up on real um, evolutionary differences. Um, I think it's important to emphasize that when you put that in a broader context, and think about your dispersal history and conserving um, genetic diversity at the continental level, that you know maybe those distinctions aren't as important. Um, but at a state level, you know, I, I think it's perfectly reasonable that people want to recognize. Um, these as distinct lineages, not species, and protect them individually. Um, so that's more or less what I have to say about um, species limitations issues in this group. I recommend going back, I think 10 are currently recognized by Q, going back to seven based on this, but I should talk through some of this with Mark as well. I'm gonna skip that slide. Um, so, I mentioned at the very beginning that one of the reasons I find orchids so fascinating is they have these really interesting interactions with other organisms. So um, one of the types of interactions that I have particularly interested in are um, mycorrhizal fungi. So orchids have this very strong relationship, especially as um, very small, just germinated plants. Their seeds um, are extremely tiny, because I guess this is all seed coat. The seed is right here. I believe the, um, the embryo at the time of dispersal is often like nine cells, as the tumor can, something like that. They're, they're, they're extremely poorly developed. They don't have the resources to establish without making contact with a particular fungus. Um, and once the seed establishes contact with that fungus, um, it's thought that they basically just sit there and break down the fungal tissue, which has invaded their cells. So you get these specialized structures, these balls of hyphae that the orchid just sits there and, and munches on, secretes digestive enzymes to break those down. Um, eventually they get to this protocorm stage, and then eventually, sometimes it might take a year or more, um, are able to send out green photosynthetic leaves and start um, sort of 
providing some carbon for themselves. But a lot of them continue the, um, their relationships with these fungi. And it's not always clear, like there's a lot, there's some evidence now to suggest that it may go back to being something like a typical mycorrhizal relationship, where the orchids are providing some carbon to the fungi and the fungi are providing nitrogen and phosphorus to the orchids. But certainly in some cases, there's evidence that they continue to steal, to basically to steal carbon from, um, from the fungi by breaking down the, the fungal tissues. Um, in Corvus, um, the existing data when I, when I started, which was pretty preliminary, suggested that the main genus that they associate with is this genus Tulisnella. Um, uh, Tulisnella, it's a basidiomycete, um, but it's, it certainly doesn't form pretty mushrooms. Um, these things look like sort of purple smears on wood um, <laughs> when they fruit, which isn't very often. Um, and even this data was, was sort of fairly preliminary. So um, there were studies done by, by Mark um, and by Warcup in the 70s and 80s trying to culture these things before molecular techniques became more widely available. Um, and in Corbus in particular, while they got sort of enough growth to say, I th we think this is a Tulisnella, um, they usually died out. So they were very, very difficult to culture. Um, so really not a lot of studies have been done on, on Corbus mycorrhizae. There were suggestions from the fact that we have two evolutions of complete mycoheterotrophy, so plants that have lost their ability to photosynthesize and are subsisting entirely on fungal-derived carbon. Um, so we think this has happened twice in Corvus. Combined with, you know, even the ones that are photosynthetic, they have that little tiny leaf, it's a big flower. Um, <laughs> the fact that they grow in these really shady conditions, all these suggested that Corvus might be a group was somewhat strongly dependent on fungi. And um, at least in some co-evolutionary relationships, that strong dependence, um, especially when one partner is you know, parasitic on the other one, um, is thought to favor specificity. So um, the idea being that the orchids having to deal with potential defenses of the fungi, having to, um, you know, being so strongly dependent on that particular fungus that they might, um, there might be, it might be advantageous to evolve strategies very specific to whatever compounds are in that fungus, um, that this might drive specificity. Um, from there to diversification is a little bit of a, a jump as well, but this is something people have been talking about in literature for quite a while. But um, especially if orchids are somewhat specific on their fungi, um, the ability then to, to use a different fungus to sort of partition um, the fungal resources out there might be something that allows for coexistence, might be something that promotes speciation <coughs> if you throw in a little geographic separation. Um, so I set out to look at this in Corvus, in that particular group that I showed you before, um, the recently evolved clade in Australia. Part of the reason I did that particular group is because I was able to get good sampling. It's the one lineage that's actually restricted to a single continent. And so I could sample all of the recognized lineages. Um, and so like I said, we didn't really even know much about what the fungi were. So part of the, the, um, the goals of this part of the study were to just to, to see what they were associating with and to see how specific those relationships were. Um, I also wanted to look at whether sister taxa tended to um, have different fungal associations, whether there was some evidence for, um, for speciation by switching of, of fungal hosts. Um, on the other hand, there have been a number of Australian genera which have proven to be very, very highly conservative, like a single genus of orchid will use a single species of fungus. And there are different explanations for how that might promote diversification, basically re, um, regarding restriction of habitat to very specific sites, um, uh, strong um, amounts of genetic divergence between those sites, etc. Um, especially with um, that second hypothesis, um, we might expect that there would be, then be some correlation between the diversity of fungi that an orchid could use and its range size. So this is something that I wanted to look at in this data set as well. Um, and finally, 
people are just now starting to recognize that you know, the availability of fungi in the environment um, might, might be different. Not all these fungi are everywhere. Um, and that there might be environmental factors that are really important in determining what an orchid is associating with at a given site. So these are all things that I tried to look at with this data set. Um, um, on the, the range size, I just want to point out that um, these major lineages do definitely differ in the range, the geographical range and the range of habitats that they can, um, they can occupy. So some of the more wider ranging things here, we have you know, on one extreme the Diaminicus complex, and on the other we have things like Corpus limpidus, which is a little band along the coast here, or Expansus, or Dentatus, which is restricted to these little areas in um, South Australia. Now this is what I was working with when I first started, when I actually um, sort of looking for <laughs> patterns and relationships, I cut down the number of uh, taxa that I was looking at because I only had, the time that I did this, these um, six well-supported clades. So I ended up characterizing them based on this. Um, so yes, you can see there's a lot of fungi involved here. Um, it certainly is not um, one of those groups where the entire <coughs> genus uses a single species of fungus. Um, some of these are very occasional. They show up as probably a secondary symbiont um, in the roots of the orchids. Some of them show up very consistently across all taxa in this genus here. So most of them, unfortunately, are unidentified. They're, there's nothing out in GenBank, and there's been a big concerted effort to catalog fungal ITS sequences, because this is what people have to work with for the most part. Um, I have like no close hits on a number of these things. So they're using fungi that haven't been recorded from, um, from anywhere else, from any other orchids. Um, this Tulisnella 8 here um, was present in all of the taxa sampled. There are um, several other groups in this Tulisnella 4 group. I defined three subclades, which, of which two are fairly frequent associates, but more so with some species than with others. Um, got another couple of groups here, Tulis Nella 5, and Tulis Nella 1, and Tulis Nella 2, um, which associate at least, you know, in more than 10% of individuals with some of the taxa here. Interestingly, we also picked up some other genera. Um, Sebacina, which isn't so surprising, um, Ceratopsidium, both of those are major fungal symbionts for other groups of orchids but appear to occur in Corvus mostly um, in combination with Tulisnellas. So maybe a secondary um, symbiont that perhaps establishes when they're adults sort of opportunistically. Um, the Tomatella here is a major fungal symbiont for things in, in North America and places, um, but hadn't been detected um, in Australian orchids before. So it's still not quite sure if that's it's real. It's definitely very occasional. Um, and then a few other scattered um, Tulisnellas. So um, I ordinated the, the fungal communities here, especially since we had so many different species of fungi um, uh, across the, the genus here. Um, and in the ordination of those fungal communities, um, one, two, three, four, five lineages of Tulisnella came out as being strong enough components that they were strongly associated with one of these axes here. Um, when we plot the, the centroids for the different corvus taxa here, we do see that different species seem to have different profiles within this community space here. Um, and as a, as a single factor, species accounts for, um, for more variation than any of the environmental variables that we'll look at later. On the other hand, um, there's a, a lot of overlap here in the communities and the environment them itself, as I'll show you in just a second, also seems to be really important. Um, on the topic of um, how these things look when we consider phylogeny. Um, in general, I didn't pick up a phylogenetic signal um, in, in the fungal community. Um, so 
we'll like, ignore what those mean specifically, but only in one case it looked like, you know, there was some conservatism, so that the, the relationship between um, the, the orchid lineage and the um, fungus lineage was, was relatively conserved. So this group here tended to um, use more similar uh, fungal communities than we might expect from chance. The rest of these, they just sort of seem all over the place. So again, this is, this is one dimension of community space in terms of fungi. This is another. This is the only thing that we detected a significant phylogenetic signal. And in no case did it seem like things were diverging um, between pairs of species, uh, sister taxa, um, more so than you'd expect from random. Um, so I also look at some specificity, because some people have reported that um, the degree to which orchids are specific is itself um, phylogenetically conserved, that some groups might be really specific, some groups might be um, far less specific, um, but was unable to detect any sort of phylogenetic signal um, in those data. Um, I looked at the relationship between range size, specifically geographical range size, and specificity. Um, I had expected going into it that we might see a positive relationship. That is, orchids expanded um, in their ability to you know, associate with different fungi, that that might open up more, more ranges, um, more uh, potential habitats. In every, um, in every test that I did of this, I either got no relationship, or occasionally I got significantly negative relationships, which was bizarre. I mean, you can see from this, this is driven by a, a single point. And mm -hmm. um, when this was pointed out to me, I was like, do you know how much work went into each of those points? Like, <laughs> and sequencing. But, okay, so, so maybe this, this isn't real, but there's, there's something interesting going on here where um, the, the breadth of the fungal community does not seem to be associated with the, 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 the breadth of, um, with, with the, the size of the geographical range and the breadth of habitats that these things can occupy. And um, this is not my figure. <laughs> I apologize for uh, throwing up a, something rather complicated at this point in the talk. Um, but there is some evidence now, as people start to look at these fungal communities, to suggest that orchids that are very specific on their fungi tend to um, associate with fungi that are fairly widespread. Mm -hmm. And orchids that are um, more generalist then can use some of these things that are sort of, just sort of available in different places. Um, so this is called nestedness. Um, and while this is looking at the number of partners involved, um, that those orchid, sorry, those fungi that are associated with multiple orchids are also usually fairly widely geographically dispersed as well. So if you think about this, this there might be a fairly strong selection against um, orchids associating with very limited, with, uh, with fungi that have very, very limited ranges, specifically associating with those populations might be more likely to go extinct. Um, on the topic of environment, um, I did find significant correlations with all sorts of um, both soil variables and climatic variables. So um, you probably don't remember this. I should have overlaid the uh, the fungi here too. But there's a couple of fungal lineages um, that are also strongly associated with this axis. Um, that seem to be associated with basically thick sandy soils. So our sand dune habitats here. And it's those taxa that are living on the sand dunes that use those fungi. Um, Tolisella 8, which is the one that was present in essentially all taxa, um, the, the vector for that sort of goes up this way. Um, and so in, in that case, um, the organisms that are using primarily Tolisnella 8, um, tending to be more specific, um, are those that are found on richer soils for the most part, um, with a strong amount of structure in the soil. Um, and we have another um, uh, important dimension here in using Tolisnella's 4B and 4C, which seems to be associated primarily with elevation. So those differences that I pointed out earlier, the, you know, look, we have stuff growing on sand dunes, and look, we have stuff growing up in the mountains, those do seem to be associated with different fungal communities. 
So, um, at this point, separating phylogeny and you know actual genetic constraints on what fungi they can associate with from environment is a bit tricky. So, I mean, clearly, um, clearly there's some signal of of species when we look at fungal communities, and when we do find these species growing together, they often tend to have somewhat different fungal communities, although they also use different microhabitats. So. Um, you know, I was hoping that by incorporating um, the environmental data, we might be able to to sort out the sort of chicken and egg problem here of, of habitat or um, sort of genetic constraint on what these things can actually use. Um, in the end, it's, it's a little bit unclear, but clearly habitat is important. Clearly species is also important. Um, and um, the fungi that these things are using are relatively diverse compared to a lot of other orchid genera in Australia, um, but also really unusual, so things that aren't being used by other orchids. So as a final note then, um, I just mentioned that a lot of orchid genera are actually quite specific. So um, in the last few years, studies have started to come out suggesting that, like I said, a single mm -hmm. genus of Australian orchid will use a single species of fungus. And Corbus is clearly not um, in that camp and appears to be able to um, utilize different fungi depending on um, different habitats um, and whether that's uh, something that's evolved or whether that's something that they just sort of have as a, that they're, they're flexible about. That may have um, allowed for some of this dispersal outside of Australia and New Zealand and New Caledonia that we do not see in other major ranges. So um, that's what I have to say. Sorry. Um, <laughs> my, um, my project uh, relied on a huge number of people all over the world, um, from the US to Australia um, to the Netherlands um, to New Guinea, uh, Malaysia, Taiwan, um, a number of major herbaria. Um, I had funding from NSF, from the Australian Orchid Foundation, from BSA, um, from the department, um, and this was not something I could have done without a lot of support from my family, um, from my, my parents, my husband, my son, my in-laws, who did a lot of child care while I was <laughs> off in the field. Um, and I am very, very grateful to, to all of you. So, um, a final note of, again, uh, various people who helped me along the way. We almost lost Tom to a Drosra in our <laughs> Here's my, my son uh, collecting leaves for mommy, even though they're not Corvus leaves. <laughs> and this is Ed de Vogel here, who uh, was an enormous help to me in New Guinea. Um, he's one of the foremost experts on New Guinea orchids at this point. Um, and, uh, Ed really likes his whiskey, so even when we were in the field and had nothing to drink of, drink out of except for uh, uh, specimen cups, and yes, these are urine specimen cups. That, we used in the field, uh, that was his shot glass. <laughs> and how tall was that limestone cliff there next to the draw? Oh uh, gosh, yeah, um, limestone cliffs in Sarawak are um, are not something to joke around with. People die on them sometimes. They're extremely extremely steep. I don't think we actually got up this way. I think we gave up and went some other direction up. But um, yeah, they just sort of, these limestone hills just sort of rise straight out of the ground with sharp, jagged edges. So lots of adventures. Well, thank you very thank much. You. Thanks. Thanks. the audience, the general audience, not the, uh, not the committee uh, uh, asks uh, questions. Uh, we'll get to ask uh, away uh, in camera uh, later. So are there questions? I have one. Yeah. I, you know, I was looking at your slides. It looked like all of them they had a circular round leaves with netted with venation. Is that right? Yes. Uh, yeah, so... Um, <laughs> and the monocots. And the monocots yeah. with that venation. Um, yeah. Um, there's a study on that? that there's when, not been a lot of study. And is. actually, if I end up doing a more sort of morphological-oriented postdoc, um, looking at um, the venation in this group, I think would be really interesting. 
So it's one of a few working um, groups that has evolved that information. So Ken's done a lot of work on the vanilloid orchids. I believe in reading through some of your stuff, you sort of mentioned that, like, oh yeah, and then in the Icky Anthony we have this as well. Um, it does seem to be associated with these things growing in fairly um, deep shade and in forests, and I mean, certainly the habitat these things grow in. So think of um, um, rattlesnake plantain locally also has net That's predation. Right. Yeah. And uh, across Monacos, at least 26 times net predation has arisen. Almost always in the shade. So do they go to C3 for the synthesis? Or? They thin, thinly use and Most of them are C3 already, but... Biomechanics. Mm. Most of the, um, the non-C3 plants in orchids are at which makes sense because they have more than need to conserve water. Thank you. Yeah, and just another similarity with the one that vein one I know, the, the rattlesnake plantain, um, is not only they have net nation, but a lot of them have that coloration, that net coloration, which could be cryptic. I mean, you know, is often described as an attempt to make it not look like a leaf or for a Right, an herbivore or something. Herbivore. Is that who, who says such things? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and and that's really interesting as well. And one of the things I was just thinking about was in um, in Southeast Asia in um, sort of Sundaland, there certainly are a lot of small deer that are native to the area. But in New Guinea, hmm. there aren't really there aren't any small ungulates. There's not a huge number of things that I can think of that sort of walk yeah. around the grant. Yeah, but the tree yeah. are foraging up and down too. So I don't know, it suggests that there might be more to the story than, than just that, um, but it is, it's it's certainly striking. Yeah. So I, uh, I was, you mentioned that when you did the genotype and by sequencing, there was one taxon yeah. that you could identify, it looked like a hybrid based on the sequence. It looks like a hybrid, yeah. And it sounds like that was one that maybe had been hypothesized to be a hybrid in advance? Yes, so, um, how do, I, how do I explain this? Um, in South Australia in particular, there are some local botanists who um, are very keen on recognizing sort of every distinct morphological form as a, as a distinct species. So even the person who found it had noted that it was kind of morphologically intermediate um, between a couple of other towns. So I think the two that he proposed as, um, as the parents were not actually the same as um, those parents would be, but I think that it's inter morphologically intermediate between those two parental taxa. It's something that seems to occur, like it, it only occurs where those two species overlap, bloom at the same time, um, and often in these somewhat disturbed environments. So it's, I think it's very likely a hybrid. Yeah. What I was curious about though is that was a case where you could see the pattern because you were sort of looking to see is there such a pattern there? Yeah. But are there, would you? If there, are, if there were other hybrids in there, would you would recognize them? Pick them would you pick them up with those data? The way you analyze um, them? Uh, not the way that I analyze them. Um, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I I've started uh, I've started running some structure analyses using these data, so actually treating them as population genetics data. Like I said, I I had very little time to actually work that into a chapter because it took so long to get it through the analysis pipeline. Um, but uh, potentially, um, I, I might think of some additional hybrids here. Yes, um, The speciation rates, the diversification rates, look as if they're on the order of maybe two species per species per million years. Okay. Um, a doubling time of a million years or so. And that, in fact, would, I think, put them in the same ballpark mm. as things like Andy and Lupins and some of these other very, very rapidly evolving taxa. Have, have, you, have you calculated those mm. and have you looked at how other the, uh, the I haven't, and it would be really interesting to do that in the New Guinea taxa in particular. Unfortunately, um, I mean, I could probably spend another 20 years mm -hmm. in New Guinea collecting all the species that are there. So there's a lot of data that are still missing. I mean, in terms of even higher than two per two, even higher two per two in the Australian uh, Corisanthes clade. Yeah, but that's on the upper end of the yeah. exactly. diversification. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, I think that we should recognize probably seven species in that group of content, but still there's so seven in a million years. What is, I'm not sure what my calculates. Mm -hmm. It's still relatively fast. Yes, well. Um, kind of a different question, the role. Did, did you take most of the Corvus close-up shots, and 
what's the technology involved in photographing those? And is there beginning to be more of a role of photography in the you know, herbarium work and the taxonomy, because so, as you yeah. showed quite clearly, the, the drawings and the specimens are <laughs> thoroughly horrible. inadequate, but your photographs were just remarkably excellent considering the, A, the smallness of the, the plant, and B, the darkness of the environment. Just, I thought your photographs were remarkable. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I mean, as early as the late 70s, early 80s, when John Jansfield was working on this group. So John Jansfield is primarily a palm expert, but um, when he was working in uh, Borneo and Peninsular Malaysia, he'd be working on rattans, which are kind of a nasty group of palms all week long. And then in the lowlands where you know, these things are snagging him. And on the weekends then, his, his hobby was to go up into the mountains and look for Corvus. <laughs> so, um, much more pleasant, much more pleasant environment. Um, so he did a lot of work on the um, the, the taxa west of Wallace's line, um, and definitely noted that color photographs were going to become incredibly important um, in um, in explaining to other people what these things looked like, um, in um, uh, being used to accompany specimens, so people could actually interpret them. Um, and certainly with digital photography, that's become a lot easier. Um, I mean, so many people are taking good macro shots these days. And, you know, I don't have fancy camera equipment. When I was, you know, trekking around Southeast Asia for five months with a backpack on my back, I did not want to be carrying $2,000 of retro camera equipment. So I have, um, like, a upper-end Canon power shot that does a, a nice macro, and that works just fine most of the time. Hmm. Um, yeah, learning to adjust the settings and yeah. uh, it took me a while to get used to doing it with a flash where I like didn't completely wash out the plant. And, but uh, yeah, it's it's not that hard. And I always go and look on Flickr too to see what people are finding. Every now, oh, someone discovered this species that no one has seen in 60 years. And, so, yeah, for the, it's but for the future, like in the next year or two or three, handheld laser units, which you could use to scan a 3D reconstruction. <coughs> Other questions? We had a few others. Any? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, you just talked about Dransfield and palms. Yeah. What extent has this virus palm oil cultivation had? Like, do you see it as a major risk to the genus, to the subtribe? So, um, palm oil is cultivated more in the lowlands, but certainly not exclusively in the lowlands. I mean, I remember driving not too far from Kinabalu National Park and seeing oil palm plantations. Um, it's it already has a very strong hold in peninsular Malaysia. In Sabah, they've been planning around um, palm oil developments for quite a while. And fortunately there, a lot of the corpus are found on really unusual substrates, which are hard to grow oil palm on. They're on limestone <laughs> or they're on serpentine. And so those areas have already been identified as, these aren't going to be great for us agriculturally. We're going to you know, keep them in preserve. Um, New Guinea is, uh, is a different case, and New Guinea is oh, it's sort of heartbreaking in a lot of ways because the logging companies are just going to town there. And after they've logged out the forest, which they're trying to do systematically throughout the lowlands, um, they're planning on putting it all on oil palm. Um, my friend Natalie's husband, Borting, um, who's from a, a remote village on the Huon Peninsula, um, the first time he traveled with, with Natalie for some Hoya, um, they flew over um, part of Indonesia that was basically all oil palms. And when he realized that's what they wanted to do to New Guinea, he started crying. Mm -hmm. um, but that is what people want to do in New Guinea. Um, how much it affects Corvus per se um, is a little hard to tell because, I mean, again, mountain ridges, they're not the great, greatest places. But I think the more that people expand the farther and farther into the forest, the fact that a lot of the population is already in the highlands, I don't think it would be do anything good for for Corvus or really any other native plants to, to see this this trend continuing again. I know most of your work is dealing with the past, but it's pretty striking looking at that map of Australia with the Corvus species just hugging that southern coast. Yes. Um, any idea about the next couple of decades what climate change what might happen to this region? Yeah, climate change is a is a big deal with these guys. <laughs> 
in Australia. I'm less worried about the vaccine in Australia than I think in terms of climate change. Um, they're already adapted to basically growing in the little wet patches on the beach. Um, um, on mountaintops of Southeast Asia, that's really quite worrisome um, as those forests continue to warm up and dry. The chances that these things are basically going to get pushed off the tops of the mountains is, is pretty high. Um, Australia's already undergone a substantial amount of climate change. So starting about 30 million years ago, especially like in the last three to five million years ago, it's became extremely arid. Um, and you know, so when I was talking about dispersal to Java, I mean, there's some possibility that some of those areas in the Northwest were actually much more habitable for, for ground dwelling orchids three to 10 million years ago. Um, but they've already, like, they have these very distinct um, patterns in there. I love a lot of the Australian orchids. They have this long uh, handle, right? And sort of an unresolved um, blade at the end. Um, uh, some re other researchers working on different groups have, have looked at sort of rates of diversification and compared them to different models. And this seems to be consistent with extinction followed by sort of continued uh, radiation at the rate that it was before. So I think that that adaptation to to dry air climate has already happened to a certain extent. Uh, obviously, if climate climate conditions change so much that the, the coastal habitats are completely out of the way, that would be bad. Um, I suppose the sea level is rising, I have to worry about that too. Yeah, sometimes I look at this group and I think, are there actually going to be any in 50 years? Yeah. Any other questions? I don't have a question, but I want to make a comment. Stephanie is correct. When she told me what her dissertation topic was going to be, I had my doubts. I know that this is a very difficult group, and she undersold just how challenging it is to collect Corvus and study it. And so I, I just want to congratulate her on her courage and tenacity in working with a very challenging group. Uh, you surpassed certainly my expectations. <laughs> and I think the entire orchid community. Um, is very impressed by what she's accomplished. I had one other note along those lines, um, and, and Mark can uh, back me up on this. Uh, director of uh, CSIRO Australian you know, Center for uh, Biodiversity Research really thought it was a very bad idea for you to go to the uh, beginning. Yes. And uh, uh, very strongly encouraged us not to, to send you. <laughs> Uh, thanks for coming and, and being so tolerant of the close uh, uh, non-North American interpersonal packets. <laughs> uh, and uh, now we're going to go to a, a private uh, interview. Yeah.